folks are already in. Um, so I think we can go ahead and get started. That way we also, um, yeah, just get you the information and give us time at the end for any questions and answers or any questions that you might have related to the program. Um, yeah, it's a good morning, everyone. Again, super excited to share an hour with all of you um, to talk about the Adventure Pass program. Um, it's been such an incredible pilot with great learnings. And Parks California has also launched a grants program and we're going on to our second year. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, just to get you an idea of what we'll be doing today, um, we'll do introductions so that you get to know um, who will be um, in front of the camera talking with you all. We'll introduce Parks California, um, our relationship and our role with California State Parks. Um, we'll do an overview of the Adventure Pass as a whole, as a pilot, where it's been and the impact that it's having in local families and communities. And then we'll talk about the grant opportunity that we're rolling out today. Um, we'll highlight key date um, because it is a very quick turnaround time. Um, so we'll, we'll highlight that and then we'll make sure to use time to review any FAQs or any questions that might pop up just during today's conversation. Um, We'll tag team, if those questions come up on the chat, we'll tag team that between Emily, Daniel, or I. Um, but in the event that we just miss one, we are certainly carving time at the end um, so that you can unmute yourself and just have a question. Um, that also works for us. Does that sound like a good plan? Let's do it. Let's do it, awesome. Well, this is your team for today. Um, my name is Miriam Solis Coronel. I'm Director of Community Engagement with Parks California, and I've been with the organization for about four and a half years. Um, as an organization, we just turned five. Um, this is our fifth um, anniversary, and we're super excited about the opportunity to be the statewide nonprofit partner to California State Parks. Um, I'll share a little bit about that in the next couple of slides, um, but in my role, I get to oversee the programs that are increasing access and a sense of belonging to place, in particular with underrepresented communities. Um, I've been doing this work or similar adjacent work for probably my whole career in different spaces. So um, it is truly a pleasure to work with park staff and partners across the state to continue to further the mission of the department. Um, our team is across the state and I am in San Diego. Um, Emily, I'll turn it over to you and then Daniel um, for you as well. Thanks, Marion. Hi, everyone. Um, great to see some familiar faces and names and some people that I haven't actually connected with virtually. Uh, my name is Emily Henry. I am one of the associate program managers with Parks California. I am based out of Sacramento. Um, I've been with the organization uh, close to three years, so three, almost three out of the five that we've been around. Um, and it's been a really fun journey. It really combines my love for parks and grant making. So super excited to be here and tell you all about the opportunity we have open. And Daniel, I'll turn it to you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Williford, and I am the Adventure Pass Programs Coordinator. And I came on board in this role in October of 2022. Um, the program had been going for a little while before that. And um, and, um, and we have this great partnership with Parks California and uh, that, that's helped um, promote this path and get it out there. So um, I'm really uh, happy to be here today to talk more about this opportunity. Awesome, thank you both. Um, Danielle has been our contact and partner in really co-creating this grant experience and opportunity with you all. So Danielle, thank you for the trust Thank you for the partnership um, to really ensure that this pass is available for more people and more families. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Um, so one of the things that really grounds us is in the work that we do. And in Parks California, um, if you were to meet staff, there is something that you'll find in common and it's really our belief 
California has an incredible state park system, um, the largest and the most diverse and rich, rich in, in many, many, many ways. Um, and there is this love, the appreciation that we have that we also want others to enjoy. And it's the ensure that people have a world class experience when when they're visiting these places so that those experiences can lead to a lifelong connection with nature. If we look at the mission of the organization, um, it's it's right here and it's really to strengthen parks to ensure that these places are thriving that they're inspiring connection. Um, because they're extraordinary places they are places for all to enjoy um, to visit and to take care of. Um, as a statewide nonprofit partner to California State Parks, um, we are the statewide nonprofit partner. It is under legislation, um, which gives us the statutory piece, the title. What that means is that we're working with the department internally to really drive shared priorities. The shared priorities um, are identified every couple of years and are really kind of the direction what sets us forward as an organization. Um, because we are a nonprofit, we are able to bring in um, cross sector partnerships, we're able to augment resources and capacity, um, and we're able to be the nimble partner, right? We understand that there's a certain beat that comes with government, um, but as a nonprofit, we get we have that flexibility. So we truly exercise it to ensure that we're maximizing and um, furthering the mission of the department and the work that staff is doing not just at headquarters but across the state um, and also with partners so with many of you here we know you're supporting part um, parks at a local either at a very park level or at a regional level so collectively um, our goal is to really work together um, to really meet those shared goals um, so this just talks a little bit of our approach, um, which is um, cross sector partnerships statewide approach when we zoom in at a very park level um, opportunity is because there is an opportunity to scale those scale those learnings share that for inspiration share that for possible taking it into another region, knowing that there will be a little bit of adaptation because each park each community is slightly different. Um, now what I'm going to do, um, hopefully that gives you an idea of who we are as an organization, our collaboration with state parks. Um, now we'll go, I'll turn it over to Daniel so that you can talk a little bit about the past as a whole, and then we'll take a deep dive into the grand opportunity that we'll share today. All right. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, all right. Just a, a quick uh, brief, you know, a briefer on the adventure pass. Um, we can go to the next slide and just kind of highlight the, uh, of some of the points of the adventure pass the overview uh, back in 2021 there was an assembly bill that created the program um, and a, uh, a senate bill that funded the program for a three-year pilot program we were actually coming to the end of that pilot program this year so the uh, pilot program for the adventure pass uh, pass program will end uh, august 31st uh, 2024 and it's a partnership between the first partner's office, the California Natural Resources Agency and state parks to provide free access for fourth graders and their families for 54 participating California state parks. And these uh, parks were chosen because of their connection to fourth grade curriculum, because of their location perhaps, because of what they offer. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons why these particular parks were chosen, but uh, first and foremost, they connect to a fourth grade curriculum, what's being taught in school so it can supplement that experience for them. The uh, pass itself is good for the fourth grade year in totality uh, from September 1st of the fourth grade year all the way to August 31st of the summer after fourth grade two. And uh, you know fourth graders also are seeing the world in, in new and exciting ways so it's a great time for them to be out in parks and sharing with their families and building up those experiences and building up that love and constituency for parks as well. Um, and it waives day use fees for these for these parks. So other things such as camping or, or other uh, you know, service added or extra added value things aren't included in this. All right. And we recently just expanded from 19 parks to 54 parks. Check out this great map right here. Oh, you can see uh, 
working with our parks comms um, division, we developed this map here to show where the uh, parks are. And they, they represent all different types of California state parks, um, like state beaches, state parks, state historic parks, uh, state recreation areas. Yeah, you can uh, see uh, there's the web address right there. On our website, there's an interactive map as well. So there's this poster map as well as a Google interactive map that you can go and click on on the little bubble and it'll take you to that park website. So um, that's a, a way that another way that we're reaching out to folks. But uh, you can see that this kind of shows a lot of the great things that the parks have to offer. And Getting the pass, uh, you, you would go to our website and click onto the Reserve California link. The passes are emailed and available on the Reserve California account page of that person. So they're not mailed out through, um, you, uh, through, through the post office. They're all digital. Um, and so folks can use their digital you know, device when they get to a park to show um, that they're using the Adventure Pass or a printed copy as well. That, those are ways that they're accepted. And uh, for folks that don't want to, uh, that don't go online or don't have that option or whatever the reason may be, uh, there is a contact center with a, a, a phone number right there. And then there's some sales offices, Park Pass sales offices throughout the state too, which we have a link to that on our web page too. So, um, and since the pass has been going on for a, a number of years, we've been able to collect some data. And um, we've got some uh, some graphs, I believe, next of some of the data that we've collected. So this gives us a look at how many passes in total were downloaded in our pilot year of 2021 to 2022, and then last year from 2022 to 2023. So our program grew huge um, in our second year. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, promotion, there wasn't as much promotion as there could have been that first year. So the second year, we really stepped it up and had a partnership with Parks California and the transportation grant. I came into my role as coordinator so I could uh, coordinate with the field sites and helping to promote the program and, and creating an energy about this program. So you can see that, you know, it worked. We got, uh, you know, a big bump um, in our uh, in our downloads. So, so th that's good news. And then this is our current state of uh, state of being with the Adventure Pass um, from we have on the left. It's September 1st, 2022 to February 15th, 2023. There were 10,738 passes downloaded. Forward to the next year, this year that we're in September 1st, 2023 to February 15th, 2024, we have 10,604 a little less, but really right on par with, um, you know, in the big picture of what's going on. But it's really telling that maybe we need to step up our efforts a little bit more to surpass all of this. So um, so we get this kind of uh, information monthly um, from our pass office. And then I don't have a graph for this, but we're also getting use data from the field sites of what, uh, of what parks are being, the passes are being used at. and. This is not a foolproof method there because there's so many ways to get into parks and there's different systems for different parks. Um, but from the data that we do have, um, there's three parks that consistently uh, have a lot of Adventure Pass use. And that is Sume State Park, Empire Mine State Historic Park, and Calaveras Big Tree State Historic Park. They're, the numbers that they're reporting are always double digits, which is super great. Um, on a monthly basis. Um, and that's not to say other sites aren't getting lots of visitation. We just haven't uh, nailed down um, how to report the data or how to capture the data for all sites yet, but, but we're working on it. So, um, so we're seeing that these passes are being used out there, which is really exciting. And all these numbers, they represent a story, a story that a fourth grader and their family are having in our California State Park system. Um, one of my favorite stories, um, uh, Lily, she's the interpreter at Calaveras Big Trees um, of family on, it was Labor Day weekend, this past Labor Day weekend, right after the new Adventure Pass uh, year began. And that family waited. They told Lily that they waited for the Adventure Pass um, year to begin 
um, their daughter was a fourth grader. They had a family of five and they were so stoked and they were looking to visit, um, you know, all 19 parks at that time. Little did they know what was about to happen. You know, that was almost going to triple and what they were going to be doing this year. <laughs> you know, so awesome. All these great opportunities. So, um, so, so that's the Adventure Pass in a nutshell, you know, and where we are at the moment. Awesome. Thank you so much, Van Danielle. Such a great overview and a reminder, right, that the state park system is very diverse. It's very different. So even tracking this data is not easy because there isn't a, a kind of a universal approach, but to be able to capture this information gives us an idea of the interest of the appetites of communities to have access to a pass that provides enriching moments for them as a family unit and an opportunity to visit again. Um, so you're right, these numbers are not just numbers, but these are families, these are individuals. Yeah, stories, yep. Mm -hmm. um, Emily, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, to talk a little bit about the partnership and how our grantees and our grantee community um, likely contributed to some of these numbers. Yeah, thanks, Marion. So like Marion said earlier, we had um, done a previous round of awards for the Adventure Pass in support of the earlier years of this three-year pilot program. So in 2023, we funded 12 projects for projects that pretty much span the whole calendar year of 2023. They technically started February 1st, but at the time there were only 19 uh, Adventure Pass participating pilot sites within state parks, and of those, nine of them were visited by those 12 grantees. And we've had some grantees finish their projects already. Some of them are carrying them through uh, the remainder of the school year and the summer. Um, but so far, preliminary data is that we can see from, you know, just of the five completed projects, they've been able to do 16 visits across the whole of them and help bring 765 fourth graders and their families into parks with different types of approaches, which I can talk about in a little bit. Uh, but our next slide will show a little bit too of where our grantees, our current and past grantees for this program are. So like I, like we said, uh, the Adventure Pass just grew from 19 to 54. Um, this uh, These are our current and past 12 grantees and where they're located um, a little bit across the state, a bit of a spread. Um, they also visited parks local to them and some of them traveled a big distance it just made the most sense of the type of program that they were proposing. Um, but our next slide will show just a little like snippet of a story. So since we do have um, some projects that or quite a bit of projects that went on all of last calendar year and um, we were able to get a sense from the participants point of view and from our grantees point of view, like what was it like to go out into this space? What was it like to use the past? What was it like to go with your family, so not just be a fourth grade visit. And here you can see a quote that just shows, you know, for a, a family in East Palo Alto visiting Hollister Hills State um, Vehicle Recreation Area, which is one of the 54 Adventure Pass sites, um, they really have found like a connection to hiking and spending time in nature with together as a family. And this is, you know, a big reason of why the pass exists and why this program exists too, is to how can, you know, this pass takes down some barriers to access, reducing cost. And also this program is meant to really bring folks out with their families and um, create a sense of belonging and a sense of ownership and a sense of, you know, place with these parks. So it's it's been great to learn over this, over this couple of years. Uh, but now we can look at what we're really here to talk about, you know, what is coming up. So what are we doing this year? So with all of the learnings from our past Adventure Pass grant program round, as well as this expansion from 19 to 54 parks, we are excited to relaunch its Adventure Pass grants program. Um, our goal for this, you know, the most zoomed out way to look at what we're doing is we are trying to support projects and the costs associated with that, that will bring fourth graders and their families into state parks and into, you know, using that Adventure Pass, coming on their own or coming as a group, really trying to find a way that how we can support, you know, fourth graders and families getting into parks, spending time outside. In terms of grant criteria, there are five main points that we look for. Uh, one is that the proposals must connect fourth graders and their families to California state parks. So we have seen some proposals where um, we have funded some proposals where there is a fourth grade only component and there is a fourth grade and family component. 
as long as that there is a uh, primarily a family component that is a piece here, that is really what we're looking for. So we have this pass available. This funding is really thinking, how can we activate community to actually go with their families and learn that on their own and maybe come back? The second point of criteria is that the state parks or beaches that they're looking to visit must be one of the 54 participating in the Adventure Pass pilot program. Uh, we have in the past allowed folks to also visit other parks. So if they say are doing a multi-touch um, type of experience or type of approach to uh, engaging folks in the outdoors, and they sometimes visit a local county park or they visit another state park that's closer to them or one that's of interest to their community, what we look for as long as the majority of the parks looking to be visited are one of those 54 Adventure Pass participating sites. Um, our third point of criteria is that thinking about community. What we're looking for is that each proposed project uh, addresses the needs and uh, focuses on some under underrepresented community that for some reason, you know, it can be financial, can be um, physical, can be emotional, anything, uh, has a barrier to park access. So there will be pieces of the application that asks to say or ask you to say, you know, who's the community? and uh, what's their barrier. Uh, the fourth piece of criteria is we're looking for projects that help people get transportation to parks, help people use the pass, help people um, really take advantage of this pilot program that is currently active through August of this year. And then our last point of criteria is that we look for proposals that um, really take into consideration what is relevant for the community they're looking to serve. So what is of interest to them? What is it that they want um, want to experience? Um, in any ways, is it co-created or informed by community? While we have this criteria, we also have a couple of preferences. So when we look at um, the projects we funded in the past and the projects we're looking to fund, we typically see that they hit one or more of these preference points. So one is that they are providing participants with multiple meaningful and relevant outdoor experiences. So really the thinking behind that is like one park visit is amazing. It can be really transformative. Where we see people create a bigger change or a bigger change of perception for themselves is when they come multiple times. So many of the projects that we think, I think all of the projects we funded in this previous round had multiple uh, park outings available as opportunities, um, whether it was to the same park or to different parks. It really just depended on the approach of the specific organization. The second preference point that we typically look for or that we will be looking for is this, is that the organization applying has a history in engaging or offering programming to the community they're looking to serve. So they are rooted in the community. They have a good understanding of what the community needs are or have a way they're taking that into consideration through co-creation or some sort of informed build of the program. And then the third preference as well is that we're looking to build on um, an existing partnership or collaboration with California State Parks. That doesn't mean you have to be, say, a designated nonprofit partner, but really what the point here is that uh, we look at all of our grant programs as Parks, at Parks California as a way to help build partnership between community, community organization, and state parks. So getting a sense of where you are at with that relationship, it can be non-existent or very early days and how this program will help you to build a relationship that could hopefully live on past the, the grant period that we'd be funding for. Then taking a look, our grant period is pretty short. So it's like Daniel said, the Adventure Pass pilot program is currently active through the uh, end of the summer. So through uh, August 31st of this year. And so with that in mind, we did take <clears throat> as much of an approach as we could to shorten the application um, and provide lots of resources so that folks can get a hold of us in helping develop their application too. Um, so our, our, our grant period will hopefully award in April and then for you know funding activities between May and August. What we're recommending is that folks can request up to $10,000 for this type of uh, grant. But, you know, if your program would cost more than that, this is not an absolute maximum cap. So always apply for the true cost of your program. And if you have questions about it, um, you know, we'll be available to talk through like what makes sense as, a, as, a, as an approach. But we do have a recommendation. Um, you know, if you're thinking what might feel good, 10,000 is what we're thinking that makes sense as a grant award. 
For qualifying application or applicants, we will be accepting um, applicants from 501c3 organizations, so uh, designated nonprofits, California Native American tribes, Native 7871 organizations, fiscally sponsored community organizations. So those who are sponsored by some nonprofit if they own their own uh, community project. And then lastly is government agencies. So think like city, county, um, we've seen both cities, both counties and uh, co county offices of ed apply as well. And then our application due date will be March 25th, 2024. Oops. It's all good. So mm -hmm. one thing that I want to call out, like I said earlier, the way we look at all of our grant programs at Parks California is that these are really an opportunity to, yes, help get folks into the outdoors, whether it's through career pathways or through, you know, outdoor access itself through um, these type of programming. But also, this is a really awesome opportunity for us to help develop and influence partnership between community, community organizations and California State Parks. So what we require for all of our applications is that uh, applicants have a conversation with state parks. So as you're thinking about what parks you wanna visit, reach out to those parks and say, hey, I'm looking to apply for this grant opportunity um, with your partner, Parks California. This is what I'm thinking, like, does this make sense? This will help you if you don't have a relationship yet, start that. And if you do, potentially deepen it and really just like help you co-create with state parks and understand what are the opportunities that are available? This isn't saying that state park staff need to be a huge part of delivering your program, rather just as like a thought, a thought partner at the beginning, saying what's possible, any recommendations, because you know they know their park the best. Uh, what you'll be required to do in your application is tell us who you talk to. So you'll submit and say, these are the parks we wanna go to, and this is who we talk to. What we'll do in the application review phase is we'll go back to those parks and just say, hey, you know, are you aware of this proposal? Is you know this something that you have been your staff have been talked to about? And then you know maybe at that point too, they might have some other tips that they thought of that we could pass along to applicants. So just know as you're thinking about this opportunity, as you're identifying what parks you might want to look at, might want to go visit, reach out as soon as you can. And if you have any trouble with that as well, let us know. We have contacts for each of the fifty four parks, um, and can help you get connected if you don't know where to start. It's never too early, even if you're on the call today and you're thinking and directionally you have an idea what kind of proposal you'll have, reach out to them starting tomorrow or starting later today. But these are folks that I think um, we often forget that they work in parks um, and they show up to work and sometimes their work attention goes somewhere else because maybe an incident happened, right? Like a natural thing, a bridge, a tree fell or something. So getting a hold of them now um, just gives you a, gives you a little bit more wiggle in, in the event that their attention is veered another direction. Thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. Great add-in. Okay, so now I'll actually be talking about the grant application itself. What are we going to be asking you guys? Like I said before, we know it's a really short application window, so we tried as best we could to shorten down the application and really pay close attention to like what will help us review these proposals and get a good sense of what you're looking to do. So these next couple slides will just have um, pulls from the application itself, but I'll go through them. The first thing you'll be asked is, asked is, did you already coordinate with California State Parks? Like we just covered, that's where you'll be asked to give us a list of who you talk to, uh, you know, names if you have them, emails if you have them. Um, then we'll go into program summary. So this is where it's your opportunity to just tell us, you know, what is it you wanna do? What is it that you want uh, to have us fund. And this is where you'll provide that detail of, you know, what exactly is the program you're looking to do? How will folks be encouraged to come to parks on their own? Things like that. And there's all these prompts in the um, grant system as well. The next question we'll ask about your partnership background. This is just so we can get a sense of, you know, are you, where are you in the partnership continuum? You know, are you very early or do you, you know, are you a designated partner of the park already? This just gives us a sense of you know, how you're coming to us, what ways can we support you and get a sense of, um, do you have an existing relationship with partnering with state parks? The next section will get into program details. Um, it will ask you, you know, tell us a bit about why the community you're looking to serve you know, has some sort of access barrier to parks. How have you partnered with that so far in the past or how have you worked with this community in the past? 
Again, to get us back to those criteria and preference points so that we can see relevancy, you have an understanding of what the access barriers are, and you have a history of engaging with these communities. The second question is how will you approach and create solutions to the issues that you described above, and then how you prioritize fourth graders and their families. So getting a sense of, you know, this Many people likely do outdoor access programming uh, that may not be specific to fourth graders and their families. So getting a sense of like, you may have been doing this before. How are you gonna prioritize just the fourth grade and families component that is a requirement of this grant program? The third question is asking about the Adventure Pass program itself. What ways can you help with folks learning about the Adventure Pass grant program, help folks download them? We've seen in projects we funded in the past, some people hold workshops, some people send instructions, some people um, will help folks one-on-one -on -one in their community. Um, but there's just getting us, giving us a sense of, you know, if that's a piece of your proposal, how will you be doing it? All right. Um, yeah, keep going. One more. Thank you. So the next aspect of the application will ask about the outputs and outcomes you're looking to achieve. So outputs are, you know, how many fourth graders do you think you'll be able to connect to parks? How many family members? How many park visits um, would you think you'll be able to facilitate during the May to August grant period? Then our program outcomes will ask a couple of questions. You know, I think this is one question, but there are a couple of leading questions to it. You know, how does this program fit into your organization's goals and programming you currently have? What kind of outcomes do you want participants um, to, you know, to walk away with? And how will this help you achieve that? And how would you measure these outcomes? So as best you can, you know, answer these leading questions. And then the project timeline, you know, we have a short project implementation window between May and August, but it helps us get a sense of like, you know, how soon do you think you'll start? What if you already have trips like planned out like weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, just give us a sense of what you have at this point in terms of the timeline for execution. And then the last, I believe, narrative section of the application will ask about your community serve. Tell us, you know, who is it that you want that you're going to be working with to bring um, into these parks? If there is, you know, a special area of focus that your organization has in connection to this community, you can tell us about it here. And then the last question is asking around what potential challenges do you see? You know, could it be some, you know, I think this is a pretty common question, but what types of things are like you think might cause some hiccups during your implementation. I think a, a, a big one that we often see is that, you know, transportation cost varies. When you quote something to when you actually do it, it does change. So, you know, there's things like that as we're just looking at what you're thinking through an implementation. And then we can go to our applica or application attachments. So a couple of things that you'll be required to submit. Um, one is a project budget. So again, like I said before, we recommend requesting around $10,000. You can request more, you can request less, but just know we do have a project budget template linked in our grant application. Uh, the second area is your financial statements, your organization's financial statements. In addition to a um, programmatic, you know, technical review of all of the applications, we'll do a financial review of organizations as well. That is a part of our grant award process. So these documents help us with that. You'll be asked for an organization balance sheet and an organization income statement. And if your organization is large enough that it does, you know, have a requirement to receive an audited, uh, an audit every year, if you have that, you know, you can send that your most recent audited financial statements. We'll also ask for your most recent IRS Form 990 if you're a nonprofit. Uh, an example of your photo and liability release since some, you know, sometimes we get sh photos shared with us and we want to know that you do have a way that you're uh, obtaining a release and right to use those photos. And then our last thing is if you are a fiscally sponsored um, community organization, just a letter saying who your fiscal sponsor is. So we have that for our records. And then the last thing I'll say is all of our application is online. All of it is online through a grants management system called Foundant. If you go to our Parks California website and you click apply, you click, you know, go into our grant portal um, on the Adventure Pass uh, information page, you will be brought into our grant system. It's very easy to use. I've heard um, very good things from the applicant side. You can save and revisit the application as much as you want before you submit. You can also um, have someone come into the system and collaborate with you. So you can both work on it in there. You can download the questions, work on a Word doc, bring it back in whatever makes the most sense. Um, when you come into the grant system, you'll come to a login page. If you have, in a, if you have applied before, you, know, if you don't remember your password, you can use forgot your password. 
If you have not applied before, it's very easy to sign up. And if you have any issues, my contact information is listed on that login landing page. So you can reach out to me um, and I can help you out with whatever you need. And I think we're going back to Marion. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, you had a very robust piece of slides and really appreciate you walking through it. Um, if we have folks that applied um, last grant cycle for Adventure Paths, something that I will note is recognizing that one, we launched this program last week, the deadline is a very quick turnaround time and the grant cycle period is short, we have trimmed down the application um, to make it hopefully easier on you all knowing that it's it's a very short window, right? Um, so as you go in, take a look at it, you can download and preview the questions. But if you did apply last year, um, it will be a trimmer version from that. Um, so one of the things that Emily talked about was reaching out to the parks that you're intended to visit in advance. Um, what I'm going to share here is a combination of what those conversations can lead to and then also some things that will be supporting you, you all with. Um, so the conversations in reaching out to the parks is to get an idea of what are the offerings that are happening there. Some of them have um, programs that are in, that could be easily integrated as a self guided experience. Other ones have docents and volunteers. Others have park interpreters, right? So it is through those conversations that then you can then integrate into your park visit. Um, and then that could also trigger conversations about, okay, if you want to use the ports program, this is the path to go. If you want to do the junior ranger, this is the path to go. Or if you want something more involved, it might trigger a special event permit, so that's the route to go. Or if you're bringing somebody from the outside to augment that um, education, that might also trigger a conversation. So all of that to say those conversations can really give you a, a, a flavor of like what are the offerings in the park and how can the park support you. And this is just a list of um, some virtual programs and opportunities that you can tap um, and learn more if you're not familiar with them. The other thing, um, a resource that we have is we understand that sometimes survey tools are not available to everyone. What we've done for our grantees, uh, we've provided a template just to get an idea of pre and post visit. How are participants feeling? Did they like the experience? Do they want to come back? especially for a program like this where it's a pass and they have the opportunity to return, what is the likelihood of them coming? In the event that your organization does not have those tools, we do provide those to our grantees. Um, and hopefully that'll bring some data and um, some, some information to you all as you think about your program, the, the type of program you're delivering. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we do is of course provide support um throughout the grant cycle because we know things change right things change within an organization or even the park for example recently i was talking to one of our park partners and they said you know what the bridge that connected this very popular place to this other place unfortunately is closed and we're gonna have to rethink the experience so things happen changes happen so what we're here to do and what we're committed to do is to be your partner and support you throughout the experience, even post award, as we think um, Emily was talking about these programs just being a vehicle for that partnership. We're here. We're here to foster those relationships. Key dates. OK, application is live. You all can take a look at it now. What is next is office hours. So we know we just shared a lot of information with you today. Um, you have access to the application, you might have questions, you might want to know like who is um, who is my contact at the park site. So what we're doing is let me just close this. Um, we're having office hours, community office hours so that folks can come in and ask questions. So these are the dates. Um, if none of these work for some reason, feel free to reach out to this email. Emily uh, monitors this email and she can get back to you um, without responding in the event that that's easier. Um, proposals are due on the 25th. 
And then we do anticipate and expect to do grant announcements in late April so that money is out the door starting in May and that money is available to grantees between May and August. For our grant awards, there is a grant agreement. That grant agreement then triggers payment um, and it's not a reimbursable. So we do process that payment in advance so that you have those monies available as you deliver on those programs. And with that, that brings us to the end of us um, sharing the information and we'll open it up to you um, to see if you have any questions um, related to the program um, and Daniel, Emily and I will help answer them. Feel free to unmute yourself or drop it in the chat. And maybe as people are thinking about their question, I can share a couple of ideas. Oh, someone someone did ask the question. So there's a question in the chat. This is what are the total funds to be granted? I believe we have around one hundred twenty thousand dollars to make in grant awards specifically. We have other funds to support the program, but um, so if we're thinking an average of <clears throat> excuse me around ten thousand dollars, that would be around twelve grantees, which is what we were at in our previous year as well. Um, but great question. And as other people think about questions, maybe I'll spark some inspiration and with some type of projects that we funded in the last grant period, knowing that that was over a longer period of time, but maybe there's something here that will um, spark something for you. So we see a we, we saw a couple different approaches. Um, the kind of biggest question I think I get a lot is like, what is like a good transportation model for these types of grant projects? And um, it really varies. So sometimes we see people busing, sometimes we see people going, you know, using private cars, caravanning. Sometimes, you know, we see people do some sort of reimbursement back to people driving their own previous vehicles, using a local partner for a transportation voucher. You know, there's lots of ways you can think about it. Um, and busing is totally okay, because that is a very common way that we see people come into parks. Um, and we also saw that approach with, you know, people going to the park very close to them, or they went to multiple parks. They looked at the Adventure Pass map and the State Parks map and said, like, where do people want to go that we're serving and figured out the transportation method that worked the, the best for them. Um, Justin asked a question about what are eligible expenses besides what was listed. Great question. Um, we encourage folks to submit a budget request that encompasses the true cost of what it would be to put on your program. So that could be staff time, that's transportation, any type of programming expenses, like do you need to buy some sort of like interpretive materials or some sort of educational materials? Do you need to buy some sort of outing equipment? Like that is all eligible and good. Food, good, all of that is stuff we will consider. Um, we also, you know, if you have an indirect cost to, um, implementing your program, please include that as well. Um, we only have an indirect cost maximum, I believe, for uh, governments which is, and universities, which is a max of 15%. But other than that, we encourage folks, apply for the true cost of your program. So I, I've said that a bunch of times, but I'd say, you know, I know I said our recommended is around 10,000. We will consider above, we will consider below. Um, and if you have a question about like, you know, d will this type of expense work? Let me know. And I can ask you. And for transportation, you know, some people also use the funding to support a vehicle they recently purchased, if you so vehicle they're planning to purchase in the grant period, it might be a little harder with this grant program um, uh, because it's such a short window. Sometimes it supports um, a, the lease of the vehicle, some of the maintenance to their vehicles. So, you know, think about that transportation too. If you're using your own vehicles, there are ways that that can be supported through this funding. Um, and I'm just gonna keep going with the questions that are popping up. Someone asked if our meal is allowable. Yes. So whatever cost of that, and there's no like maximum of what you can pay per person for a meal. Like we, we uh, encourage you to budget again, true cost of your program. If uh, food on site is what you want to provide, include that if food is a take home. Sometimes people do like takeout bags or lunch bags afterwards. That's good too. The other thing that I'll add um, to that allowable expenses is depending on the engagement and the partnership with parks, um, sometimes an experience like this might trigger a special event permit. 
um, that is totally an expense that is also allowed. So meals, special events, cost materials, staffing, interact, all of those are pieces that you can include in your proposal and in your budget. What else? As more questions pop in, um, what we'll do as well is today's uh, presentation was recorded or is being recorded. We'll go ahead and follow up um, later today with a link to the recording, a link to the deck that we shared with you today, and then information about office hours, and then the link to the application so that you have everything bundled in one email and you can access it and also share it with your partners or even with your colleagues. Yeah, thanks, Marion. The last thing I'll just repeat again, because I want to make sure it's clear for folks too. Um, the question we often get asked is, can you, can you visit parks outside of those 54? And yes, that is totally allowable as long as the majority of your visits are at the one of one or more of those 54 Adventure Pass pilot sites. Um, reasoning, you know, why could, would someone potentially want to do that? Say they're trying to build up, you know, a, a great um, like series of visits and they want to go most local first and then inch out, you know, maybe that's that. Or they want to do a, you know, a big day trip. Maybe they hit two parks and one Adventure Pass park, it makes total sense and it happens to be right next to another park and they want to do that too. So just know you can be creative with the parks that you want to visit as well. Um, and, you know, if it's just the park that's local to you, that works too. That is totally fine. Any other thoughts? Well, just to reiterate what Miriam had said earlier, um, it's not too early to reach out to the park. Um, they can make it all happen. Um, and the interpretive staff, they're quite busy. So, um, but they, they've got time for you. So go ahead and reach out to them and um, and start that process now, even if it's just an idea, even if it's just a kernel of an idea. Um, yeah. And if you're not quite sure who to reach out to, um, Emily can help, I can help, we can all help you connect to that, to that person. Um, and get ready to kind of help with these transformative, transformative experiences. Um, not mentioned in this, uh, in our uh, presentation day was the documentary that it, that's being made right now from the last grant cycle. The stories that were captured in that documentary will reinforce why we're all here, is to connect people, you know, provide access to parks and provide meaningful, relevant, experiences that may even like transform that individual through that afternoon and what we see captured in their documentary which whenever that's ready i can't wait for the world to see it because it really it just highlights the importance of why we are all here and um so please reach out if you even just have an idea we can do our best to make it happen thank you thank you for that reminder well, it looks like we've answered questions. Um, if that's the case, um, we will follow up um, with all this information. And thank you for everything that you do. I think, Daniel, what you shared about these experiences, you all see them every day. You are the ones that are at the forefront of these moments. And if it wasn't because of your efforts, there would be less people. So thank you for what you do day to day to build these relationships and connections with nature. Um, these are moments that are transforming people's lives. And we're super grateful that you're there and that you're committed. And we get a chance to support um, the work that you all do. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody.